Welcome to Luthiers and Legacy Show, a podcast created especially for fine violin makers and luthiers, as well as musicians passionate about making positive change in the industry of music. Hi, my name is Dimitri Badiarov, former professional musician, turned award-winning speaker, business coach and mentor, violin designer, passionate about creating instruments for world-class musicians and dedicating my life to helping open-minded instrument makers to keep the ancient master's acoustic concepts alive. Today, it is the launch day of Luthiers and Legacy podcast, and I am excited to have the opportunity to invite you to the conversations with experts. To make it a real celebration, you are getting the chance to win seven days of live online training known as the Old Masters Tones Technique for free. You will learn the ancient masters acoustic concept so you can create even better instruments for your musicians. Other students traveled thousands of kilometers and paid over 3000 euros to learn this, but you are getting a chance to get this for free because it is a celebration day. All you have to do to win your free ticket is subscribe to the podcast, leave a review, take a screenshot of your review and post it on social, tagging myself in the review. This is how I will be able to find you. Regardless whether you have been in the profession for decades or you're just starting out, it's time for you to shake things up and start making even bigger impact. So without further ado, let's do it. Let's get started with today's show. Dear friends, welcome to Luthiers and Legacy show. I'm so excited by the opportunity to invite you to this conversation with Sam Zygmuntovich. Besides being one of the most inspiring violin makers today, someone who inspired me for years, uh, Samuel is also an educator, researcher, and public speaker, regularly sharing his knowledge at museums, conferences, workshops, such as the Oberlin Acoustics uh, Workshop and the Juilliard School of uh, music in New York City, among other places. He's also the creative director of the Strad 3D project, and his clients include some some of the most celebrated musicians uh, today: Leila Josephovich, Yo Yoma, Maxim Vengerov, Joshua Bell, the Emerson String uh, Quartet. Uh, Sam has produced several um, uh, scientific publications dedicated to his research of Duport Cello by uh, Antonio Stradivari, Titian and Huberman Valens by Stradivari, Plauden, Guarneri del Gesù Valin, and the um, uh, 1796 Mantegazza Viola. So mm. it's a big honor, Sam, having you with us on today's show. Very warm welcome. Well, thank you for inviting me. And I, I really appreciate the, what you're trying to do and trying to uh, look at instrument making from a wider perspective. Thank you. Let's get to the meat of things straight away. What is your best kept secret? <laughs> well, you know, it's, uh, uh, I don't really believe in secrets. I, you know, so um, I've trained already uh, a number of violin makers, um, uh, two gold medalists, uh, one silver medalist. Uh, so when I'm teaching people, obviously I'm, I'm not holding back information to them. Um, and uh, when I study old instruments, I also assume that there is no secret. There's just things that we didn't discover yet. And that uh, the more open information is, uh, uh, I feel myself by giving out information pretty freely that I open myself up to receive information from many other sources that I, I wouldn't. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely uh, agree with that. Uh, sharing, uh, giving away to receive um, it's very interesting what you mentioned with all this research and sharing openly information with other instrument makers and um, yeah, have very uh, strong uh, connection to that philosophy as well because I'm also sharing generously with, with my students, instrument makers. Uh, tell me about the time when you decided to launch the Strad 3D project. What was the trigger for you to begin that project? Well, to, to be honest, um, the Strad 3D project did not begin as my project at all. It, uh, it was an outgrowth of the violin, Oberlin Violin Acoustics Workshop. Mm -hmm. um, the Violin Acoustics Workshop brings together physicists and engineers with violin makers. Okay. 
uh, uh, Dr. George Bissinger, who was a premier researcher in this country, uh, had been doing really uh, top level acoustic research for many years. And he had the opportunity to, to um, there's a company that makes 3D vibration scanning lasers called Polytech, it's a mm -hmm. German company. They offered, he has, he had one of these, a single uh, two-dimensional two laser, but they make a three-dimensional laser, which you can actually track motions in three dimensions. It's quite elaborate and quite expensive. And they offered to bring it to his lab if he could find a Stradivari. So actually I just came into the project as a, um, the strad handler or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you know, I had clients who I was able to convince to lend uh, two beautiful strads and a great Del Jesu, which we brought to the lab. So in the beginning, I really came in just uh, to assist Dr. Bissinger. Uh, mm -hmm. And once I started to see the kind of information he was coming up with, it was unbelievable imagery. And uh, the kind of things I'd been wanting to see forever, like how do things really move when they vibrate? You know, we try to imagine it, but uh, mm -hmm. all of a sudden we could see it. And I thought, these are things that violin makers just couldn't even dream. True. But then I thought that violin makers already have such a uh, sophisticated way of gathering measurements and photographs and description and documentation. And if you could put those two approaches together, you would have the most complete look of, of, of these violins that have existed yet, two completely different ways of seeing. So uh, once the basic research was done, and I did participate in directing it a little, uh, but I'm not a physicist, to be clear. Mm -hmm. But then I thought, I'm going to expand this project. I will take Dr. Bissinger's work. But then I invited my friends to uh, just do more. Um, I had great photographs taken. Uh, the Emerson String Quartet's recording engineer, uh, I managed to go to one of their sessions, and we did uh, reference recordings of the three violins involved, uh, with one player playing the same excerpts in a great hall with a great engineer. Um, I collected many papers. Francois Denis. Uh, who has uh, done um, uh, recreations of Renaissance drawing techniques that were used on old instruments. He analyzed the Plowden and the Titian and recreated the designs and put that in there. Uh, George Stepani, who is, uh, um, I think, one of the brilliant bridges between violin making and yeah. acoustics. He wrote some articles and uh, uh, anyway, I just like, it, it's a great power. Maybe you're finding that in your podcast. It's a power just to invite people. Absolutely. I, I just wanted to ask, um, I have seen some of those images or uh, well, rather videos on YouTube. Are those the uh, 3D laser images that you're referring to? Yes, I am. Yeah. So brilliant. So I have, uh, I have seen those. I think there are two, maybe even two channels on YouTube, I believe, where people can find. So there is one YouTube uh, channel where it is your personally and the other one dedicated to three to the Strat 3D project, am I, am I correct? Yes. Brilliant. Okay, well, then I will definitely find links uh, and put them in the description of this podcast so our listeners and viewers can find that information. Essentially, and, essentially, yeah. our listeners can find it uh, very easily when they just type the Strat 3D project in YouTube and they will find those videos, I believe. Yes, well, the website uh, um, and is strat3d.org. Strat .org. Org. And, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, for a violin maker, you know, like, as I say, I'm not a physicist myself. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bissinger wrote some, I think, important papers based on his research, which are quite difficult to read for a non-physicist non and, uh, and quite difficult to interpret. But you just look at these videos on YouTube and you feel like you have seen something that you didn't see before. Mm -hmm. You feel like your mind has expanded and your understanding mm -hmm. has expanded. And, you know, Absolutely. you asked me... You asked me before what um, about secrets, and uh, I don't really believe in secrets, but something I found that if you want to call it a, 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 an interest or a talent or uh, is it, just putting things together from different sources, like yeah. meeting a scientist and being able yeah. to get involved and then meeting yeah. a designer. Yeah. And I also involved filmmakers in this project. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there's anything, I think that uh, uh, something that I enjoy is, is looking around and taking things from different areas and saying, oh, this belongs together. These, these, in, these two pieces of information, these two worlds, mm -hmm. they belong together and I can see how they fit together. How beautiful. So what were your biggest finds as a result of this research? Well, um, for example, I mean, one of the things to be clear, it was, we were studying strads and guarneries and people mm -hmm. say, well, if you looked at a strad uh, vibration and looked at a cheap violin, would they look different? And the answer was no, not really. <laughs> yeah. uh, 
uh, because there are still violins. So people expected, um, you know, they're asking me, well, did you find the secret of Stradivari? And the answer is no. But mm -hmm. what I found was maybe something uh, more important, which is how do violins work at all? Mm -hmm. What is happening? You see a box of wood. It's just, it's just, it's just sitting there, right? Um, so how does the, and then the person's playing it. How does the playing go into the violin and the sound come out? That's something we can't see. Mm -hmm. And with these kind of images, all of a sudden it's like, now you can see it. So it's almost like a um, concept conceptual uh, mind changer. Uh, from yeah, the, yeah. I hate to use the word, but you know, it was really a paradigm shift from seeing the violin in terms of its history and its beauty and its craftsmanship and seeing it instead as a tool that is a dynamic tool. Wonderful, this paradigm shift. I actually like that expression. Uh, that story that you have just shared about almost like seeing how the violin functions in this three-dimensional space uh, reminds me an experience I have had in Italy a long time ago, 1997 or something like this. I was uh, on, on a visit with my dear friend, uh, Professor Marco Tiela, who happens to be the founder of the School of Violin Making in Milano. And I remember he took me to some private collection or maybe even public collection. There was a a holographic photograph of a violin or viola that was actually um, sounding. So there was some kind of device, probably, I don't remember the details, probably there was some kind of device that would excite the vibrations in the instrument. And then the instrument was uh, photographed holographically. And I was quite amazed that I was actually able to see sound waves in that holograph. You, you could actually see how the waves spread around the bridge. And um, so, and what you have done, you have essentially taken this idea to a whole step, just much, much, much farther. It's like, wow. Well, for instance, on the video channel on YouTube on strat3d.org, um, there's one video of the actual um, uh, 3D animations. Another video was my, my consideration of F-hole design which was trying to combine, not from a scientific point of view, but from a violin making point of view, okay. you pick up a violin, uh, why are the Fs this shape? And what would happen if they were a different shape? And why mm. are they in the places they are? Mm. So it's a bit speculative, but in light of the imagery I saw, the vibration scanning, CT scans, uh, 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 what are the F-holes doing? How are they moving? And the, 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 it, you see the design instead of seeing just like an outline. Now you see like the, the uh, tabs of the wing, of hell wings are vibrating. Um, the, the whole middle of the instrument is pumping like this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you, you don't see the instrument the same anymore. So to me, this is, it was a much more inspiring way to work instead of feeling like I'm a woodworker or which I am a woodworker. Yeah. Uh, but instead of just feeling I'm making an object, I don't think of myself making an object as my primary mission. I have to make the object, it is a real thing, but it really exists in relationship to the musician and to the sound. And therefore I am creating the experience that the musician has. I'm creating the sound that the listener has. There's all these connections and there's a, the, the, the musician has to put their intent and energy into the violin. Mm -hmm. And then the violin does something. And then the sound comes out. And we are in charge of this little middle ground, which is kind of like a, a filter or a circuit or a machine or whatever. And what we do inside this box will help determine what the musician can express. So True. it's a very, a very direct and very interactive experience, which for me is it's a, a very connected uh, feeling. Yep. Yeah very true on a very human uh, level between yourself and the client and then you oh, take it all the way all the way to the audience and try to imagine see that there is a lot of impact from that little object it's it's fascinating um the whole journey that you have taken with this uh, very highly uh, technical uh technology intensive rather a uh, process of research uh instrument this is something that is uh, diametrically uh, uh, opposite direction from from what I have uh, undertaken myself because um, I definitely was fascinated and inspired and by all this uh, technological advice and research and so forth. But there was one uh, period in my life when in Italy I met 
a, a chemist uh, and a very advanced guitar builder. He makes beautiful guitars. His name is uh, Giovanni Intelizano, and he was used to work at one of the most advanced chemical laboratories in Italy. And I'm speaking about 1997, and with uh, with the help of Marco Tiela and Giovanni Intelizzano, we were doing some kind of analysis of varnishes and grounds, mm. uh, base coats from some instruments, which were, of course, nearly impossible to obtain. So this would normally cram, come from uh, chippings that would be preserved from some violin restore workshop, uh, because we obviously couldn't take it, just take it from an instrument. Mm. And we did uh, a lot of research and Giovanni said, well, they know, the, the chemistry is uh, the organic chemistry of varnish is so complicated. There is almost no way of knowing precisely how they, uh, what they used originally, because the, the the resins and everything continues to oxidize and react with uh, with lots of elements that are present in the human sweat in the atmosphere and so on. And he said, he said, you know. Uh, you definitely will find more when you just go to the libraries and start digging into the ancient sources. And this is what I thought, wow, that's actually really uh, a great idea. On top of this, as a musician, former musician, I was inspired by the example of Sigiswal Kirkin, who is a Baroque uh, mm -hmm. music expert. And I thought, what if I apply the same approach to instrument making and just go to the libraries, find the sources on uh, early acoustics, early design, aesthetics, and then just try to re-imagine how the original instrument makers have seen the object. Mm. How did they create this? Then I came up with, uh, with certain system that I'm now teaching to instrument makers. It would be very, very interesting to uh, share this with you eventually and see how that system uh, can be refined further? How can this system be uh, plugged in into that research that you have done? Essentially, we are speaking about uh, surviving treatises, books on uh, aesthetics. We speak mm -hmm. about original instruments that confirm that, yes, those instrument makers, they knew what is written in the sources. And then it comes to the technical skills of drawing. Yeah actually yeah well well one thing i would say is that um, i don't want to give the wrong impression you know i i am uh, very excited about some of this research but to be honest about my own training it is uh, quite quite traditional i started young i went to violin making school i worked mm -hmm. with carl becker who i think yeah. was one of the best uh, violin making uh, representatives of a violin making family in america and then I worked with Rene Morel and Jean Foncet for five years doing restoration on old instruments. I've done a lot of uh, copyist work on old instruments, but really it's just a direct observation and trying to replicate. Uh, so, and I've done a lot of restoration. So to me, uh, the other research is not a replacement for this traditional training. If anything, I found in the traditional approaches, I reached limits to the question, to the answers I could get. Okay. Um, so I would, um, even, even from the most knowledgeable people, I would say, well, what, what does, what happens if you do this or that? Okay. And, uh, um, I just found that, um, violin making as a profession has a huge body of uh, traditional knowledge. Mm -hmm. And there's something I talk to my students about. It's kind of a joke, but I, I call it a CVT, the collective voice of tradition, which is that if you don't know the answer to something like every, every detail probably matters until we, you know, we just have to assume that every detail, no matter how small on the instrument would make some kind of difference, but we don't know what. So um, we could try to, we could experiment, but if we don't know, then we should preserve the form as completely as possible. Mm. And then if we want to preserve that, we have to ask, what have the most good people done the most often for the longest amount of time? And unless we have better information, we can kind of assume that what the most and the best people have done for the longest time is probably pretty good at least. And that should be our starting point. So my first yeah. question when I'm designing my own instruments or working on things is what is the, what's the collective voice of tradition say about where to put the F holes or how far apart the eyes should be or how long they should be, how close to the edge. I well, that's my oh. starting point. Yeah. Once I have that starting point, then I could go further and ask, okay, well, you know, so Strad has, is this long, Warner is this longer. So what's the difference? Um, can you see any difference in those two types of instruments? Or Guarneri over the course of his career went from pretty conservative, not super long FLs to very long FLs. So can you say anything generalizing about the difference between early Guarneri's and late Guarneri's? Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, you know, I'm not, I think your approach of, of, of trying to understand, uh, uh, you know, in a way, even saying Strad 3D, it was 3D because it was 3D imagery. But to me, it was also 3D in terms of, of, uh, of uh, 3D knowledge, um, okay. knowledge from every source, yeah. uh, like the pen opticon or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and mm -hmm. that the more forms of information you could bring into the same sphere, Mm -hmm. Then, um, and also, you know, because of the type of project it was, I published it uh, we, uh, digitally first on DVD and now it's on, uh, on, uh, on downloadable. Um, and, but, and a web format is perfect because you go from, well, let's look at the photographs. Hmm, that's what it looks like. Well, let's, how, let's look at the measurements. You can see the measurements. It says, well, what is it? Well, let's see the arching. You'll see the CT scans. Well, what does it sound like? You go to the music recordings. And what is the spectral content of these sounds? And you can go to the sound analysis and see the spectra. And well, what is the motions that's causing these? Then you go to the modal analysis. Um, uh, and then what is, and then you, you end up in, uh, in articles about it and, and examination and study. But uh, that's, uh, to me, that's the most, the, the most enjoyable way to look at things. And also I think, uh, um, uh, you know, people tend to be experts in small fields. And uh, I'm an expert in my small field. I'm not a scientist, I'm not a physicist, but like I said, I am uh, someone who can communicate with many people. And uh, I think the scientists, scientific community that I have met felt the same way, which is why they put up with me, you know? I mean, yeah. Yeah. someone who, can't, who doesn't, can't do any serious math at all, yeah. um, hasn't, doesn't have a college degree, why do these people talk to me? Um, and I think um, uh, we recognize each other's different spheres of expertise. Mm -hmm. It would be really fascinating to, um, uh, to share with you the system that I have uh, ref been refining for 30 years. And so this system actually uh, was my yeah, assimilation of the historical knowledge, the ancient master's thought process that I could read mm -hmm. in the treatises in the past 2000 years, starting from the uh, ancient Romans and all the way through the Middle Ages. And then of course, all the 16th, 17th, 18th century sources, which were lost even by the Italians. Look, when, when we go to uh, Antonio Bagatello, the first treatise ever published on, on violin making by an Italian violin maker. And he was a sort of in influential violin maker because he was um, restoring uh, violins of the students for Tartini for 30 years. That means that he started to well, the treatise uh, Regole, the rules for the construction of mm. violins, violas, and, uh, and double basses, that was published in 1780 something, 1782, mm. three. Um, but he started uh, uh, collecting that information uh, definitely about 30 years before that date. Mm. That means that the knowledge which he did not include and which is in sources like Pablo Nassar, like Marha Mersenne, like um, Mark, Marcus Polio Vitruvius um, and more, these sources, they, they, they did exist before him, but he didn't know anything about the sources. So that we can say that, look, even the Italians have lost that proportional knowledge. Mm. We reintroduced also to uh, Masterly by Francois Denis. And uh, yeah, th this is what, this is the thing that I was really dedicating my entire life to reconstructing this way. How did they, how did they, uh, decide the, the shape of the instrument. Why it has this width and not another width? Mm. Why, yes. why the F holes have this length, not other length? Mm. Why, why the corners are placed where they are placed? They, they could be placed anywhere else. What is the common thing between all these different models and different makers? Because there is a common thing. And to finally, all this research, which was quite a nightmarish in the beginning, was so confusing. And I would need 350 pages manual to memorize my own process. Mm. <laughs> And I thought, no, that cannot be true because if that was so complicated, then the ancient masters would have left some manual of some kind, but they didn't leave anything. Uh, that means that the process was really easy to remember. Mm. And now I see why it was easy to remember because look, if it is proportional, um, uh, harmonical proportions and harmonical mm. proportions, you can translate it to notes and then you can simply sing the tune of a violin as a <laughs> melody. And this is something that I've been teaching in the past few years. It will be really, really fascinating to share this knowledge also with you and see uh, yeah. how that plugs into your research. Because, yeah, I like that your idea of three-dimensional 
research and I am absolutely ignorant of the latest tech and how that, I, I, I'm really not knowledgeable at all in that area at all. So that we really fascinating. No, I would I would love to hear what you're what you're um, what you've been finding out. That was one of the reasons I was very happy to yeah. have François Denis participate yeah. in the project yeah. because Wonderful. These are some of the questions it's like, why is it the way it is? Why how did it get to be the way it is? What so what's the abstract design that underlies the whole thing? Um, and then what uh, the other, the next part of that is uh, what techniques and tools were available at that time. Mm-hmm. Because like you say, it should be something kind of simple and almost inevitable that would give such a consistent yeah. result in that period. Yeah. So it had to be something that comes very natural from a certain way of handling tools. Absolutely. And, uh, and uh, so, so why, you know, why was it designed the way it is? What kind of tools make it easy to do it that way? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then it, just as far as, so that's like historical, like what you've been working on. Then there's documentary, documenting what's here. Well, with all that, so what do we actually have? of the master instruments, yeah. the most successful ones, what examples do we have? And then this other work, um, you know, to me, a lot of my work is really not in the science lab at all. It's adjusting instruments with musicians mm-hmm. in real time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, and this is, I don't use any technology at all for any of that. The technology is something I do on my own of spare time, yeah. but, uh, but it is um, very much, um, there is the idea that things, uh, you know, who knows why they took the form they did, but having taken the form they did, those forms are very significant and you change small things like, for example, moving a tail gut a couple of t- a tenths of a millimeter will have an, a, an effect on a sound yeah. or tapping the bridge that much, or if the bridge is a tiny bit thicker yeah. or moving the sound post very slightly. Yeah. So all these things are having a huge effect on our perception of sound. Um, and uh, so uh, one of the things I think I learned from um, Rene Morel, was that um, you can't just think, well, it's just done by a series of numbers and rules, and then you just follow those rules. Uh, I think Rene, you know, um, in his time, it was, he considered it an innovation that, that there were no rules, that you, um, there was the basic form, and then there were the musicians, and then you had to listen to the musicians, and the musicians would tell you whether it was better or worse. Yeah. And in a certain point of view, if you work interactively with musicians, you try something and they say it's better good. Do more of that. It's worse. Yeah. Do less of that. Yeah. It's almost yeah. an automatic, simple process if yeah, you are sensitive true. to the yeah. feedback loop. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, you know, because even the process that you describe actually lays out the framework of the instrument quite well. However, you know, I mean, on old violins, for example, you might, you might have a, a Monty's where the, uh, the F holes are 36 millimeters apart. And then you might have something else, a like Guadagnini or who knows what, or Steiner, where they're, they're um, I don't know what the widest I've seen, but for 45 or something more, like that. Yeah, something like yeah. that. So it's a lot of difference in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so even though the basic uh, principle, of viol- they're all violins, they're not that different. But however, within the context of a violin, they are very different. Yeah. So how do you decide? So then you need actually something more than just a, a, a static proportions then you need actually a dynamic system which says okay you bring the f holes more close together you make the top more flexible in that point you bring them further apart you capture more of the arch and it makes things stiffer so you have kind of a a dynamic relationship you do more of this you get more of that so it 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 turns into a um, a rational potentially rational and potentially understood process even if we don't understand it yet we believe that it could be understood. Yeah, we have that. Uh, with some of this knowledge, definitely we gain a degree of control over, over what we do. So that's very helpful. But then, yeah, there is always a portion of mystery in uh, yes. all of this. Yes. There are just so many variables like uh, arch. What is the exact shape of the arch? What is exactly the nature or density of the wood? What is the combination of wood? Um, and, and on and on and on. Well, well, you know, one thing I will say that, um, you know, when I've talked to violin makers who are not involved in acoustics, mm. uh, uh, they often uh, say, well, what did you learn in acoustics? And I try to explain something and the things I'm explaining are not that practical to them or not that understandable. And I just can see that it, it, is, it isn't part of their worldview. So uh, in a way there is, uh, you can make a perfectly good violin without any piece of technology, not even a power tool, not even an electric light bulb. So um, 
it's more of a, a, a worldview or a personality, you could say, that wants to look at things certain ways. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's, it's a, a lot of my involvement in the research is more how, how, I, want to, how I want to see my, my own place in this world and what I'm doing and my relationship to the tradition. You know, partly, you know, one of the things about tradition is um, I'm not Italian. I wasn't born in a violin making family. My family are uh, war refugees, basically, um, and uh, never were involved in these fields. And uh, so I come in as you could say, I'm very much an insider now, but um, I came in as an outsider. So to me, it's like, it's just all, um, for example, um, Joseph Curtin and I were once in the museum, the town hall in Cremona. And uh, we were there with a documentary crew or something. We were looking at the violins and mm -hmm. discussing. And then we were just walking and then we walked into the, the painting wing of the same, it's all in the same building. And there was a, a display of Cremonese painters from the Renaissance. And it was typical Renaissance Italian painting, crucifixions, annunciations. And, uh, and Joseph and I were looking at it and say, you know, this part we don't relate to so much. You know, we, it's, so it's not that we are trying to be back Cremonese uh, in 1700, because we wouldn't fit in. You know, so it's very much a, uh, you know, even though we are in an ancient profession, we are not, we're not living in ancient times. We are people with our own sensibilities. Yeah. This is exactly why I chose to dig very deep into the historical documents and approach violin from the perspective of a Baroque, of Baroque music, which is why, mm. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just to be a little bit more part of that culture, so to speak, like um, have that connection with the roots. Uh, yes. Well, also as a musician in background, you already are connected to the field very intimately from the other end. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think uh, for any of us to be involved in this in a deep way, we have to somehow connect to some piece. Absolutely. Deep. How do you see your place in the tradition? What what is your contribution into the tradition of violin making as a as, as a cultural tradition? I believe. Well, I mean, well, if nothing else, even uh, I, I believe that I've been involved uh, through teaching and writing for the yeah. Strat in opening up the uh, the way that we see the violin. Like yeah. the posters, I, I did these uh, articles and posters for Strad Magazine, mm -hmm. and uh, I think I was the first to include CT scans. Mm. On the posters to see the arches uh, and to, uh, and, to dis and a little more discussion of acoustics. Uh, and then through the Strad 3D work, uh, it's not that I am, so I think, and also I think I have served as a bridge, uh, you know, among the violin. I taught at the violin making workshop in Oberlin for many years and also at the acoustics workshop. And I was sort of a, 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 a you know, in the violin world, I would say, why don't we know more? And then in the acoustics world, I say, why can't we do more? So I was always yeah. bothering somebody. But I, I, so I think that I've, my role has been as someone uh, it, bringing things together yeah. um, on the one hand. Uh, on the other hand, professionally as a maker, uh, I've been super fortunate with my clients. And, uh, you know, I am not a professional musician, but I am a musician and uh, lucky with my training. So I think I've been very much in the middle of working with top level musicians in a very intimate way here in New York. Mm -hmm. And so I think, uh, you know, my work has probably helped open a way for other violin makers to be successful as well. Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. You inspired so many instrument makers. And it's beautiful, it, the, the choice of words. Uh, you mentioned you are a little bit like a bridge. And um, well, I think that's uh, great musicians and great instrument makers and artists or people who contribute, they are in a way bridge because what we do, we contribute so people can maybe connect things together, get from where they are to where they want to be. Uh, I want to share you this uh, little story. Mm -hmm. um, when I lived in Tokyo in between 2005 and 2010, uh, I was a freelance um, uh, musician, uh, I mean, I, I was not employed as a musician, so I like to organize my own concerts every now and then. So because I just, I was making instruments, of course, but I also will like to be on stage so that I don't forget how to play. And um, my Baroque violin had a black bridge. So it was just black, painted black bridge. 
Yeah. And everybody asked me, wait a second, what is this bridge made from? Is it ebony or no, no it's not ebony, it's, uh, ma it's maple. Why is it black then? <laughs> then I told, I told, well, if it's not black, then nobody asks me why it is black. <laughs> <laughs> and then I would ask, do you know why violin bridge is called bridge? And they would normally say, oh, no. And actually it is in Italian, il ponticello. El mm -hmm. puente in Spanish, in English, it's bridge. Why bridge? If anything, it's not bridge, it's string holder or something you put under the strings. Why in French it is chevalier? What is it? Why in Russian it is kabulka, old Russian, which is also chevalier? Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Wow, never thought about it. But then I would take them on a journey. It's like, well, let's go to the 9th century or 8th century or 7th century, like dark Middle Age of Europe, and you see those uh, medieval lutes almond shaped. And what do you see in those almond shapes? Well, you see a geometrical figure called Vesica Pisces. So two, in, two circles intersected mm -hmm. in, in the center. And the bridge was connecting the centers of two circles. So there is mm -hmm. a lot of symbolism in Vesica Pisces because one circle was symbolizing the world of the humans and another circle was symbolizing the world of the gods. And the bridge was connecting the two worlds together. This is why it is called Il Ponticello, El Puente. And That's... in French, Chevalet or Russian, or old Russian, Kobylk is the same because until the invention of photography, people believe that uh, the horse is the link between the, the earth and, and the divine because they believed that when the horse runs, it doesn't touch the ground. So it was like so uh, soaring in the sky between the heaven and earth, which is why it was considered to be almost a divine oh. um, animal. And they would be like, my audiences in the con concert in the concert hall, they would be just listening with their jobs, uh, uh, <laughs> jaws <laughs> dropping down. Ah, <Right. laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Wow, never, never, never heard about this story. And then I would say, well, you see, we have just connected to each other through this beautiful story. Hmm. So there was a bridge, wasn't there? Yes, absolutely. It's a beautiful story. <laughs> uh, uh, Samuel, what do you what do you believe uh, is the biggest issue in violin making tradition today? Violin uh, issue is a it, it's a, there's political issues. I don't know if there's violin <laughs> making issues, okay. but uh, one of the things I think it's the same issue that is uh, facing all of classical music, True. which is. Um, how you know that the the uh, our fields are dominated by old forms and dead composers and dead designers yeah um and then how do we fit in um, as creative living craftspeople so for example even at this point i have designed many designed means made small variations on like, like i i've made probably 13 different viola models or something like that you know wow or more, because I'm always looking for something a, a little, um, uh, a little different. But anyway, yeah. it's not very different. And but and I'm still making instruments that have antique looking finishes. Yeah. And um, I think, uh, so it's to say that, how do we, uh, where do we go? Where do we fit in as individuals, creative individuals? What is there left for us to do other than reproduce what has already been done? Yeah. So, and I think that musicians, to some extent, there is contemporary music, but, uh, that, you know, contemporary people who play contemporary music struggle a little bit because the audiences so often expect the standard repertoire. Mm. Um, and I think for us, you know, violinists expect, so to say, the, the standard repertoire. So um, I guess that's an, that's an issue that I personally uh ask myself, you know, what am I contributing that's creative or new at all? Yeah, yeah, well, you are contributing so much with uh, with your re reinventing the instrument, creating your original models, taking it um, to uh, very modern, super equipped labs and doing this very high end research. That's, that's, wow, that's, uh, that's, that's, you are the bridge in that sense. And um, for, for myself, yeah, I'm, I'm going in the exactly opposite direction. So I'm going down to, to the centuries and, and, and uh, teaching this, uh, mastering. I'm always continually learning. I'm continuously learning and mastering my own process and then teaching that as well. 
And it's very interesting what you said about the tradition, like, yeah, musicians or audiences expect quite a lot the, the standard repertoire. And that reminds me Leonardo da Vinci's words. Um, I believe that was in, uh, in the Atlantic Codex where uh, these words are uh, written in the manuscript. He said something, the art of painting declines and perishes when artists have no other sources of inspiration, but the art already created. And when I read this first time, ages ago, in a, a giant, giant volume of Renaissance aesthetics, I thought, well, that's absolutely applies to instrument making, because if instrument makers have no other source of inspiration, but uh, posters of instruments already created, or even actual instruments already created, then we kind of, they're contributing into a problem. And that's what I thought mm, I should be doing the opposite. So I should definitely try to understand the ancient master's thought process and then just uh, go ahead and create my own um, mo my own models and then share this knowledge with other instrument makers and also musicians so that they understand, hey, but violin is such a rich, profound object with uh, thousands of years of culture beneath and it's beautiful. Hmm. What is well, it, I appreciate your, your perspective. And, you know, it's uh, both of these poles exist in our field, which is the very, very deep roots of it and how there's something that carries through of a collective human knowledge yeah. from a long time ago. And then for me, uh, um, I guess what I find, uh, you know, I'm focusing on a little myself is how, how is it alive in real time in the moment with a musician and an existing instrument and how to optimize that instrument? Um, so, uh, you know, but I think all these things are like, how do you recontextualize something which seems to be very known already and very set already okay. and, uh, and place it in a new context and to engage with it in a new way. Um, you know, cause like, uh, for example, I mean, the question that always used to be asked, which is tiresome is like, well, what, what was Strad's secret and why can't modern instrument makers do what Strad do, does? <laughs> and, uh, I thought, well, let's just, there's no answer to those questions. Let's just not answer them. Let's choose a different question. So um, that was what I have done, which is that who knows what Strad's secret was. Um, and let's just, yeah. how does a violin work? How does this thing make sound? Yeah. And how can we make it better? Um, yeah. There's good ones, there's bad ones. So you could say that uh, uh, for me, it's uh, uh, it was an escape from this little prison cell of, of um, the, the, you know, why is the past greater than us? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent related to that. So that, that was the same thing as a result of all this research for me into into the um, aesthetics and yeah, philosophy of the ancient masters that allowed me to to create my own models with more freedom, ease, with flow. Well, you, and, yes, well, you, you you can use the same um, source material as. Yeah. Strad and to, to create your own work. So you're in the same, you've drawn from the same, but you're, you're starting again, like having a, a, the, the original recipe. Yeah. Beautiful. Samuel, what is your biggest lesson as an instrument maker, if there is such a thing? Well, t t t uh, to me, it is... Um, you know, and people I, I work with, I try to teach this, which is that um, uh, they say there's nothing so bad that it couldn't be worse and nothing so good that it couldn't be better. Mm. So um, from wherever you are at any moment, um, you have to identify the flaws and then you have to identify the opportunities to improve. And, uh, and it doesn't matter where you're starting from. If you're very accomplished or just beginning, it's the same situation that you, whatever you have created, some things could be better and there is some opportunity to improve. So, um, and no matter how good you are, it's the same thing. So if, if you cultivate this way of looking at things that, um, all right, well, that was a good try. What, what are we gonna do next time? What could be improved? Um, it, it, it's, it gives a pattern for a, a life of, of um, development. Sam, that was so beautifully said that I, I just want to stop here and not ask you anything anymore. <laughs> Because I think it's so beautifully what you have just said that um, I just want to leave our audiences with that. They can digest and think about this and get really inspired. And, and hey, 
yeah, apply what they've learned from this um, episode in their work as instrument makers or musicians, uh, share this with more people, share it with, with audiences, uh, inspire more people. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for the opportunity. It's great to see you. Great. Great to see you as well. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Do let us know what did you like about today's show and do let us know what would you like us to cover in the future episodes. Remember, today it is a very special day. It is the launch day of Luthiers and Legacy podcast. And to make it a real celebration, I'm willing to offer you the chance to win a free ticket to my iconic training known as the Old Master Stones Technique. Over the course of seven days, four sessions, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know in order to design instruments with ease, flow and freedom using the ancient masters knowledge documented in a number of historical sources and documents. All you need to do in order to win your free ticket is subscribe to Lucius and Legacy podcast, leave a review on any one episode, take a screen print of your review and post it on social with a tag, tagging my name in your review. This is how I will be able to find your review. So it is super easy. Remember there are just 20 spots available. That means that most likely you have to write your review right now and post it on social tagging Dimitri Badiarov in your post. That is all for today's episode. I'm really looking forward to inviting you to the next conversation with the next expert. I'm really excited about this. Really looking forward to sharing with you a lot more. Take care and see you very soon.